pretty, isn't it? And believe me, that trucker is a modern miracle of mechanics. And the man who built it... Well, let me tell you something about Preston Thomas Tucker. The first time he ever saw an automobile was back in 1912. In the excitement of the situation, he found himself on a muddy road with the wheels of that automobile passing over his legs. But the mud was soft and he wasn't hurt. And that was the first view of the machine that was to mold his thoughts and actions for most of the years of his life. It started a series of plans and actions that brought the Tucker car that everyone is talking about. And why shouldn't they talk? This new Tucker has everything. Has individual wheel suspension. It has a rear motor. And it also has... Oh, but now wait a minute now. I'm getting ahead of my story. I'll tell you more about the car later, but first... Let me tell you a little more about the man Tucker. Preston Tucker is a man who believes first, last, and always in the American way of free enterprise. Though there are those who believe there is no more room in this country for new industries or perhaps new competition is more correct, Mr. Tucker doesn't feel that way. Even when just a kid, Preston was giving competition, but fair competition, to automobile dealers in his hometown of Cape Act, Michigan. He bought up cars that seemed hopelessly wrecked. Those that were basically sound, he rebuilt and changed in his mother's backyard and resold them on the open market. His shop was the barn in back of his mother's home. And today, though his shop is not a barn but the world's largest automotive plant, this same Preston Tucker is changing the design and mechanics of a modern motor car to bring you the new Tucker. back to Mr. Tucker, just to point up an incident in his early life that led to the building of this revolutionary car. Back in 1921, young Tucker was continuing to show his interest in things mechanical. This time, it was the flying machine. At Monroe, Michigan, a parachutist with his troop refused to make a jump, and Tucker took his place. The jump went smoothly, but the landing didn't. He came down on top of a moving freight car. The chute pulled him down in an embankment. Well, while he was in the hospital, he worked on an engineering course by mail. This was the first of many mail and night school courses that were to come. He lacked college or university training, but his self-teaching, drive, and ambition were to make him the recipient of an award presented by the New York Museum of Science and Industry, naming him the Automotive Man of the Year 1947 for his outstanding achievements in designing and developing an advanced type of automobile with new and improved features of safety and performance. To Mr. Tucker, it probably seemed like a long trail from that beautiful car back down to that barn in his mother's backyard. It was here that he worked for years on the dream that was to become his automobile in reality. From this workshop came the ideas for the Tucker engine and transmission. And too came the ideas for some of the wartime inventions of Preston Tucker. In 1936, Mr. Tucker saw the war clouds looming on the horizon. And he put aside his plan for building his car to work on ideas for war equipment should war come to his country. After months of intensive engineering and designing work, he built the Tucker combat car and later the famous Tucker gun turret. The combat car had everything, including his power-operated gun turret, complete bulletproofing and air conditioning for the operator. However, it had one drawback. It was too fast. A hundred miles an hour, the fastest combat car ever built. At that time, it was the opinion that a combat car shouldn't be driven over 35 miles an hour, so the government wasn't interested in contracting for any at that time. And besides, the prospect of war to many seemed remote, but it would have been a nice thing to have in 1941 and 45. This gun turret, however, was one of Tucker's wartime inventions that was used to very good advantage during the war. It was power-operated, and at the touch of a button, revolved a full 360 degrees around and around and up or down. United States bombers, BP boats, and other war vehicles were equipped with this gun turret. It was another of Preston Tucker's inventions, but he turned the patents over to the United States government during the war. After the war was over, Tucker went back to his life ambition to build his better automobile for the American public. 
Then came that wonderful day in June 1947 when the new Tucker car was christened at ceremonies in the newly acquired Tucker plant in Chicago. And with over 2,000 dealers looking on and applauding the car and the building. This newly christened car was complete with its safety chamber, its interchangeable front and back seat, wide enough for four persons, and only five feet from row to row, the first to set the pace for newer, lower-built automobiles. The dealers saw that the new Tucker had the safety sponge rubber crash panel. They saw the beautifully different instrument panel. Tucker drove away from his hotel in Washington, he carried with him a new lease on the Mammoth Chicago plant. A never say die spirit has won other battles for Preston Tucker. Even before obtaining the plant, he had to get money to start the business. He well, here's more proof you can't get away from a Tucker. You can hardly believe it. Actually, it took years to get all the improvements to be found in this car. There are some scenes showing a fleet of Tuckers being test driven on the Indianapolis Speedway. Since the Tucker was actually developed on the Speedway, it seemed logical to make the test there. What's that? Oh, you wonder why I say it was developed on the Speedway? Well, here is the reason. Back in 1925, Preston Tucker teamed up with the late Harry Miller, and between them, they produced 11 of the 16 winners at Indianapolis. In their years together, they designed, engineered, and built many of the great racing cars of the era. Death was to cheat Harry Miller of the opportunity of continuing automobile engineering research. Tucker carries on alone. Tucker rear engine special was just one of the many built by the Tucker Miller combination. Year after year, as they worked on races such as these, they were planning to build an American passenger car that would have all the stamina and engineering qualities of their winning races. And this was the result. These tests at the Speedway, plus road tests from coast to coast, proved that the Tucker car, though as big as the biggest, is nearly as economical to drive as the smallest car. It is a big car, 130-inch wheelbase, 166 horsepower rear engine, wide seat, front and back cushions interchangeable, and capable of riding four persons comfortably. The car is capable of 130 miles per hour, however it hasn't been opened up completely yet. At moderate speed, it gives well over 20 miles to a gallon of gas. But speed is not the main thought in building the car. The Tucker symbol is a symbol of safety. And great plans were made in the engineering department to make it the safest car on the road.
take a look at this structure. It was doing over 95 miles an hour when it was turned over three times. Yet they jacked it up, put on a new tire, and drove it away. Do you know of any other car that was driven away under its own power after turning over three times at 95 miles an hour? Oh, by the way, the driver got only a scratch on his arm. As you notice, the Tucker safety windshield popped out. No lacerated faces from going through a Tucker windshield. No bruises or broken bones from hitting a hard bag. The sponge rubber panel and crash compartment of a Tucker are obvious safety features. If an accident happens, you're safer in a Tucker. Just imagine you starting a pleasant weekend in a tucker. Put the suitcases in the front, and away you go. And while you're riding, let me tell you why you're getting the safety, dependability, and styling that is so far ahead of all other motor cars. Mr. Tucker, who is directly responsible for the car, has devoted his life to the planning and building of this car. His first real automobile experience came when he was 13 years old. He was hired by the vice president of the Cadillac Motor Car Company to fill the important post of office boy. Tucker immediately made plans to expedite his duties of delivering messages, reports, schedules, and other jobs. He asked his boss, B. McCall White, who is now an advisor to the president of the Tucker Corporation, for some skates so he could get his jobs done faster. He got the skates and also an instructive course on engine and chassis design. Five years later, he joined the Ford Motor Company to continue his learn-by-doing method. After years with Ford, who, by the way, also found that breaking into the automobile business was anything but easy, Tucker went into the sales field. But before doing so, however, he rounded out his engineering background by working in every department of automobile production, including the foundry, production lines, and in all the shops. Once in the sales field, he worked as wholesale and retail sales manager for Studebaker and later for Chrysler. Still later, he was zone manager for Pierce Arrow, later was a Packard distributor. When you drive your Tucker into a filling station, it won't take nearly as much gas as you're used to buy. Just fill the tank and you're off again to continue your trip in a really smooth riding, powerful, fast and safe automobile. Tucker and the corporation had not had to fight for their very existence. 